go. Success. Okay. All right. So, um, yes, I'm Adam Forney. I'm from Microsoft Research. And as was mentioned, we'll be uh, talking about how, uh, we'll talk about managing uncertainty in time expressions for virtual assistants. Uh, and um, I'll try not to activate any virtual assistants when I give this talk, but we'll see how that goes. All right. So one of the common pieces of advice when we are um, interacting with virtual assistants is that we should speak to them as we would to a person. So Microsoft, for example, will say, if you're not sure what to say to Cortana, don't worry, she'll often understand you if you say things the same way you would say to any person. Apple, on the other hand, will say, talk to Siri as you would to a friend. And so we're going to abide by that, device, or that advice in this presentation, and we're going to talk to virtual assistants about time. And we'll see how that goes. All right. So this first example uh, is one from my own personal uh, history of interactions with Cortana. I asked the agent to help me remember that a new microwave was going to be installed sometime on Thursday. And Cortana helpfully offered to create a reminder. But I immediately hit an impasse here. I can't proceed. And that's because, uh, well, I activated Cortana. There you go. Um, because uh, the save button is disabled. Why is it disabled? Well, it, because I haven't provided a time. Why haven't I provided a time? Well, because I don't know when that microwave is going to be installed. If I did, I would have said so in my original utterance. So there's already this impasse here, uh, this disconnect. A similar problem happens when I interact with, with Siri. So in this case, I ask Siri to uh, remind me to pick up milk later today. And a reminder gets created. But you might notice here that the reminder is set to go off at 12 AM, and it's already showing up in red. Why, uh, why is it 12 AM, and why is it showing up in red? Well, that's because uh, it recognized the word today in my utterance. Uh, and in this example, today started 11 hours ago. Uh, so when will I get my reminder? Probably never, since it's set to go off in the past. And I don't mean to pick on, on anybody here. Uh, Google Assistant wasn't available at the time when we started this work. But we can try the same thing there. I can ask Google Assistant to remind me to meet with Paul after lunch tomorrow. And this time, for a similar reason, um, that gets mapped to 8 AM tomorrow morning. It missed that phrase after lunch. So the point I want to, to drive home here is that when we speak about time in these natural settings, we use rich language, often uh, laced with uncertainty. And often that's intentional. Right? In that microwave example, I actually didn't know. I didn't have the information I needed in order to actually um, to provide that to the agent. But modern virtual assistants right now, they lack the system support to capture the spirit or the intent of these uh, imprecise temporal expressions. They often funnel you into one of uh, two different paths. You can either insist on precision, like what Cortana did, or um, we have these static interpretations that may not always be appropriate. And before you say, OK, well, this is easy. We can just add, uh, we can just recognize these phrases uh, and move on. It turns out that people get really creative uh, when they speak naturally about time. These are some examples uh, that I was able to pull out of an email corpus that I'll talk about in a little bit. But we see things like sometime between the end of the year and early next year, or um, later this week or early next week, for example. So uh, in this presentation and in this, in this work, we, we take baby steps to try to, uh, to uh, resolve this problem uh, by asking and answering three research questions. First, we ask, uh, for which tasks and under which conditions are people most likely to use imprecise temporal expressions? And we'll answer that by, uh, uh, with a survey. Um, then we ask, how are imprecise temporal expressions actually manifest in natural communications? And for that, we actually analyzed an email corpus, as I alluded to earlier. And then finally, we ask, how do people expect virtual assistants to actually respond when these imprecise temporal expressions are used? And for that, we actually we built a prototype. We had people use it, and then we, we conducted some interviews. So I'll round this out with a little bit of related work and some design implications and a conclusion at the end. So in terms of related work, there are three categories that I think uh, I really need to address right up front. And that is that uh, there's been a ton of work looking at extracting temporal expressions from text. That This includes both uh, precise time expressions, like dates or times, as well as the imprecise stuff that we've been talking about. And in fact, we'll use the SU time library later in this work. Um, there's also been a lot of work in uh, time and schedule management by virtual assistants and uh, as well as uh, reasoning under uncertainty with conversational systems. Our work builds on all of this. We couldn't do our work without this prior uh, research. What we add to this is uh, we look at some of the reasons why people choose to use these phrases in the first place and how we can build virtual assistants to better match these intentions. All right. So to answer that first uh, research question, um, for which task and under which conditions are people uh, likely to use imprecise temporal expressions, 
we deployed a survey. Uh, and the survey was divided into two parts. In the first part, we asked people to discuss general situations where they felt that these imprecise temporal expressions uh, were uh, appropriate or preferred. And then in the second part, we asked people to discuss concrete scenarios involving a to-do list, including some of their own to-dos. So the survey was actually sent out to a random sample of employees at Microsoft. We had 338 people respond, and they occupied a variety of different job roles, so they weren't all software developers, for example. And uh, in that first part of that uh, survey, as I mentioned before, we were really interested in these general situations in which people preferred to use these uh, imprecise temporal expressions. So we asked people to reflect on how they would communicate their own to-do list to a human administrative assistant, and people had to rate their agreement to a statement that began, uh, I prefer to use imprecise time expressions, like in a few hours, when, and then we offered a bunch of different completions. And what we found was that, uh, in fact, there are many, many situations in which people prefer to use this imprecise language. Uh, so everything from when not being fully committed to a task to um, when it takes a long time to do or when the task can be done quickly, et cetera. There's a number of reasons why people said that they would, would prefer this language. At the top of the list, there are three very similar ones that I want to call attention to, which are um, when, uh, when the, we, one is not fully committed to the task, when it's low priority, or when it won't be done for the, uh, until the distant uh, future. So we can think of this as sort of low priority, low urgency situations. And uh, just below that, we find two additional ones that are really interesting, which is um, when the task depends on other tasks or people. So this is maybe uncertainty that arises from external situations, so it's external dependencies. So these two themes I, wanna, uh, I want you to remember because they're going to come up again in a minute. So in the, uh, in the second part of the survey, we asked people to provide date and time estimates for uh, items in a to-do list. That to-do list was pre-populated with five random to-dos from prior work, and uh, we also asked people to input two to five of their own to-do items. And we asked people to, uh, to answer the following, or to complete the following sentence. I am most comfortable answering with a date or time that is accurate to within, and then we gave a drop-down where people could choose uh, a minute, a few minutes, um, you know, an hour, a few hours, et cetera. And what we found was that um, when, we, when we actually grouped these to-do items according to sort of broad categories that were uh, outlined by uh, David Grouse in, in work last year, uh, so things like attending an event or switching or managing a process, that'd be like cooking, all the way down to, uh, you know, doing chores, uh, et cetera. Uh, what we found when we grouped the uh, to-dos and the responses by, by these broad categories, we found two sort of general clusters. Uh, on the top there, you see these tasks that uh, typically people were really comfortable providing uh, re reasonably precise estimates of when they would actually complete that. Uh, whereas uh, on the bottom, we have tasks that, um, that uh, people were much less willing to provide a, a precise estimate of when they would get to that. Uh, and in that bottom category, I'll just call out that, first of all, um, we have communicating and arranging or scheduling. So this is arranging and scheduling. This is like uh, when you're planning a meeting, for example, and you haven't scheduled it yet. Uh, we can consider those as, a uh, again, these situations where there are these external dependencies, uh, which we saw earlier. And then I, I might argue that uh, running errands and doing chores, so running errands would be like picking up milk, you have to go somewhere to do it, and doing a chore would be like doing laundry, they might fall under that low priority, low urgency uh, category. But I guess the main takeaway from the survey is that there are very real situations, very common, very real situations where people actually choose and prefer to use this imprecise language. All right. So the second research question that we want to uh, address is, uh, well, how are imprecise temporal expressions actually manifest in natural communications? And so what we did here is we actually analyzed interpersonal communications, uh, corporate emails actually, to learn how people were expressing time. And the nice thing about analyzing an email corpus is that these exchanges were occurring between people without any expectation that they were going to be interpreted by a, like a virtual assistant. So people are feeling free to use whatever language they feel is appropriate. They don't have to think about the limitations of uh, existing agents. So we used, what, uh, we used a, an email corpus called the Avocado Email Corpus. This is a corpus you can license for research purposes. Um, once you filter spam and remove duplicates and everything else, that uh, boils down to about th uh, three 180,000 unique emails exchanged between about 230 individuals of a, uh, a now defunct technology company. And what we did is we ran the SU time parser over these emails, but we extended the SU time parser to uh, recognize uh, additional modifiers as well as temporal conjunctions and disjunctions. So things like 
uh, after the, or later this week or early next week. That would be an expression that uh, this could now recognize. And uh, what we found when we did this is that these imprecise, the imprecise forms, the, these imprecise temporal expressions are incredibly common and diverse. They follow a, a classic Ziffian distribution. It's almost a perfectly straight line on that log-log plot. Uh, and that uh, within there, we see that roughly 80% of all of the temporal expressions occurred three or fewer times, uh, and 60% were actually unique. So the take-home message here is that we can hand-tune methods to cover the head, and that might give us a little bit of traction early on, but really, we need to generalize. I mean, a lot of, the, a lot of these expressions occur in the tail, and we really have to go after that tail. Uh, the other thing that we did, and I'm not going to talk about it too much in this, in this presentation, but I encourage you to look at the paper, is we looked at when these expressions were used and how they were likely interpreted. And what we found were there were these strong temporal uh, periodicities. So you would see things like later this week uh, occurring on, on uh, certain days of the week, or uh, on the right-hand side there, you can see that next weekend, what people were interpreting next weekend, uh, there was some uncertainty there where some people thought it was the weekend that's closest to you, and other people thought it was the weekend of the next week. Uh, and so you can see that bimodal um, uh, uh, issue there. But that tends to clear up after, a th after Thursday. If you say next weekend uh, on Thursday or later, it tends to be resolved. All right. Um, so the last research question that I, uh, I want to address here is, um, how do people expect virtual assistants to respond to imprecise temporal expressions? And for this, we actually we built this uh, prototype virtual assistant um, that could serve as a design probe. And we could control all the aspects of this, of this virtual assistant. And in fact, we uh, used the same method of detecting these imprecise expressions as we did in the previous, um, uh, with the email survey, or sorry, the email uh, corpus analysis. So we were able to recognize this much broader set of, uh, uh, of expressions. So we had people come into the lab and use this virtual assistant for some time, and then we interviewed them. We had 14 people do this, and the, the whole session lasted about an hour. And uh, again, this is, um, I mean, if you've ever looked at these, uh, these done these interviews, you, you realize just how rich this data set is. And so um, there's, I could spend 15 minutes just talking about what we learned just from these interviews, um, but uh, I don't have time for that. So I'm just going to call out a few of the high level lessons that we learned. And I encourage you to go to the paper to see some of the supporting quotes and examples. But the first one I think is, um, is really interesting. It's that very often uh, the imprecision, this uncertainty, was implicit. Right? If you look at a phrase like, uh, well, as an example, if I told you that I was going to stop by your office in two minutes, you're probably less sure of when I'll get there than if I said I'll, be, I'll stop by your office in 17 minutes. Right? And so there's often these cases where on the surface, the, the sentence structure and everything else looked identical, but there was this implicit uh, uncertainty that was being communicated in some cases, but not others. There was also uh, many cases where there are these implicit constraints. If I say I need to complete corporate training tomorrow, I probably mean during business hours, even though that wasn't stated. So um, there are these implicit constraints based on the task. One of those implicit constraints that kept coming up was uh, preparation time. So if I say I need to pack my bags for my trip to, uh, on Sunday, I need to know about that well before my flight takes off, right? Well before, you know, my, my trip on Sunday. So uh, very often uh, we, we need to build some of that uh, preparation time into, in, into our understanding. Uh, one thing that almost all of our participants tried at one point uh, in, in the um, interviews was to, um, to make reference to personal or cultural milestones. So this could be things like birthdays or holidays or uh, uh, other events that may uh, happen in the, uh, on their calendar, uh, including things just like uh, their children's sporting events and things like that. And then the last, the last uh, point I want to make here is that very often times uh, there was some uncertainty, there was some ambiguity, but it wasn't intentional. Uh, this, I mean, language is ambiguous, and, and these are cases where um, the, the, there was some legitimate uh, ambiguity that... Uh, we couldn't resolve. So that would be things like, uh, we have one participant who said that they needed to be reminded to buy tickets for the concert next month. And our agent said, okay, I'll remind you next month to buy tickets. But the, it was actually the concert that was occurring next month. They needed to buy tickets much earlier than that. So uh, there, there are a number of examples of this as well. 
Uh, I think there was one other example where someone said that they needed to follow up for dinner plans on Sunday, or Saturday or Sunday. It was the dinner that was a Saturday or Sunday, not the fact that they needed to follow up on uh, Saturday or Sunday. All right. So um, with that, I just want to conclude with uh, design implications and where I think uh, we need to go with our virtual assistants. The first is that we really need our assistants to start respecting imprecision. Right? We've, we've, uh, what we found with our survey was that there are very real situations where people uh, choose to be and actually prefer to be imprecise. Uh, and so we really don't want to be funneling people into these cases where they have to be precise or where they have to correct um, some, some resolution that occurred too, too soon. But if we're going to respect imprecision, we also have to be able to recognize it. And this means going after that long tail, right? We need to... Uh, we need to broaden the set of expressions that we can recognize. And this is really important because if I say that I need to do something a little later today, but all we recognize is today, then that's a failure, right? But that's what we saw in the opening examples. And likewise, if I say I'll get to that next year, I don't mean in, what, 31 million seconds from now. I mean, broadly speaking, I don't know, some 12 plus or minus two months from now, probably. Um, and then the last, the last uh, point that I want to make here is that I think there's an opportunity here to embrace flexibility. So if we're, not resolving these, if we're not resolving these expressions right away, what can we do? Well, if I say that uh, I'll do something later this week and it's a Monday, then there's presumably a lot of time before we actually need to take action on that. And so if things aren't eminent, Maybe a system can delay action, gather some additional information passively. Maybe it can uh, behave oppor opportunistically, like uh, delivering reminders at an op opportunistic time, or uh, maybe the next time you open your calendar and you're able to see your schedule. Or maybe we can just employ other strategies that take longer to conclude, like maybe we could use crowdsourcing to help resolve some of this ambiguity. So with that, um, I, I will conclude, but in, in my conclusion, I need to address that um, really this presentation is, uh, in, is in memory of uh, our intern, uh, Shin Rong. He's the first author of this paper who unfortunately passed away earlier uh, this year. Uh, and so yeah, with that, I, I, I will conclude and uh, open the floor to questions. Uh, yes, uh, with regard to the, uh, the long tail and expressing imprecision in time, yeah. uh, what is your viewpoint about um, how to handle that in a virtual assistant? For, I can think of a couple of examples that maybe you can comment on. One is you use uh, machine learning and you harvest just vast amounts of data and you try to distill it out of that. Alternatively, you can try to make the natural language understanding deeper and richer and try to understand metaphors and from first principles what the meaning is of utterances. And so do you see, have an opinion upon those dimensions or are there other dimensions, other approaches you would take? Well, I mean, I, I do have an opinion. I mean, we, we, are, we are pursuing one of these uh, directions, which is uh, the, the former, uh, which is basically if, if you have a uh, virtual assistant and you are able to recognize that something is a temporal expression, roughly speaking, but you're not exactly sure how to resolve it, providing people the opportunity to uh, correct that in the interface, maybe to you know, uh, provide feedback or to um, highlight the, the part that's the temporal expression or even correcting maybe early interpretations of that, uh, of that expression uh, in the interface itself uh, provides uh, training data that we could use later to 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 broaden um, to broaden the set of expressions that we can recognize. That's that's what we're pursuing right now. I think it is a really interesting question, though, uh, how to how to grow uh, and uh, generalize these methods. But right now, we're hoping that we can gather lots of data and uh, user feedback in order to, to to learn these expressions. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, my name is Beverly, I'm with Google. Mm -hmm. um, in your third study, did you ever find that participants were um, more unlikely to um, rely on their assistant for these imprecise tasks because of a perceived over-precision that the, um, the system would require? Well, in, 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 the, in the interviews, um, we, we did have people who were surprised by the interpretations, right? Um, in one example, we had somebody who said, uh, who just created um, uh, a to-do, which was something like, uh, revisit my will in five years. And we picked five years exactly from the day that they made that uh, expression. And they were surprised 
by our interpretation of that uh, and, uh, and kind of laughed a little bit. Uh, there are other examples as well where people were um, basically making notes about um, b buying, you know, holiday, pre like Christmas presents or, or birthday presents and things like that. And again, we're surprised at um, the fact that we were pulling out the holiday or we, that we were being overly precise with, uh, with when those reminders are being delivered. And that speaks a little bit to the preparation time as well. Thank yeah. you. I'm curious about the, the third uh, research question with the, the user expectations. Yeah. Um, did, you, did, did they have uh, expectations of the system that it could do more yeah. than a human could do? Uh, <laughs> a human assistant? Because no, no, not, not that a human could. Saying? Well, we did, we had a video that everybody watched at the beginning that showed the capabilities. And one of the capabilities we showed that w was that we could recognize a broader set of these expressions. Uh, so they, they were under the impression that they could speak uh, more freely about time than they could for existing virtual assistants like Cortana or Siri. Okay. Uh, but they were not under the impression that, uh, that it was better than a person, no. But, but did they have expectations of it that it could make inferences about time that a human couldn't, like if you, if you told me to remind you tomorrow that your uh, microwave is being installed, my, my first question would be, well, what time tomorrow do you want me to remind you? Uh, as a human, I wouldn't know how to help you. Should the system know better than a human assistant would be able to, and did they have expectations that? Oh. Um, <laughs> could it exceed human capability? So in, 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 our, in, our, in our design, what we had was we had, oh, I don't have a good picture of it, uh, unfortunately. Uh, basically, we had basically like, a, like a, a, a canvas where we were uh, making recommendations of things that they would have to attend to. And it was more of like an ambient display than uh, like a, a reminder that would buzz your phone. And in so that sense, they would expect to see that, from that item show up in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, that, in that canvas. Um, when it was appropriate. Uh, so this would be, I don't know what the human equivalent of this is, uh, but essentially uh, what we, we told our, our participants is that um, they should see those to-do items like rise to the top of their list around the time when it was uh, likely to be relevant, right? And so uh, that gave us a little bit of, of wiggle room where we could, we, you know, we didn't have to be perfectly precise either. Yeah. As I mentioned, uh, this paper uh, received an honorable mention, which is uh, awarded to the top 5% of submissions to Kai this year. So I got some certificates for Adam and his co-authors, so let's congratulate them again. Thank you.